uh, League of Women Voters in Rochester. I would like to welcome you all here tonight, the candidates, the audience, and those viewing at a later time. Welcome to this forum sponsored by the League of Women Voters Rochester. We'd also like to thank our generous sponsors, partners of tonight's forum, the Rochester Post Bulletin, the Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce, and the Rochester Public Library. Due to the current pandemic, we are limiting attendees to the candidates and necessary volunteers. We are following social distancing and the wearing of masks according to guidelines. The League of Women Voters is a volunteer organization organized at the local, state, and national levels. We encourage citizens to participate in government. While we as a league do study and take stands on issues, we never endorse or support political parties or candidates. The views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates, not those of the League of Women Voters Rochester or any partner or sponsor of this forum. And the sponsorship of this forum is not an endorsement of any candidate. It is our purpose in sponsoring this forum to provide you with the opportunity to hear candidates discuss face-to-face -face issues that are important to you. Tonight's questions have come from the League of Women Voters Rochester, the Post Bulletin, the Chamber of Commerce, and members of the public. If you would like to submit questions for a future event, visit our Facebook page, League of Women Voters Rochester, Minnesota, for information and deadlines for submission. There is never enough time to cover all the issues in a limited time and setting such as this. So feel free to contact the candidates' campaign headquarters directly if your questions are not addressed tonight. We'd like to thank all the candidates for running for office, for offering to serve your community, for the enormous time, dedication, and commitment that running and serving demand. We encourage our members as individuals as we encourage each of you to get involved in your community and the political party of your choice. Welcome to tonight's forum, which fe features the candidates for Minnesota Senate District 26. Candidates for this seat are Elidi Borud and Carla Nelson. Each candidate will have two minutes to offer an opening statement. The candidates will then respond in turn to questions provided by the League of Women Voters Rochester, this evening's partners, and by the public, which were submitted in advance. Candidates will have 75 seconds each to answer. The candidates then will have two minutes each to make closing statements. I would like to suggest to candidates that your answers be as succinct as possible. It isn't necessary to use the entire 75 seconds for each answer but finish your sentence when your time is up. We would like to uh, time, we would like to cover as many questions as possible. Each candidate also has 30 second rebuttal cards. These can be used at any point after each candidate has answered a question, but only one rebuttal card may be used per question. Please put the card in the black basket after you have used it. The time keeper tonight is League of Women Voters Rochester member Christian Pavick. Questions from the public were, suggest, were checked to ensure they follow our guidelines, the League of Women Voters members, Maggie Brimajon, Jane Callahan, Deb Duffy Smith, and Kathy Swessel. Answering questions tonight will be Matt Stoley from the Post Bulletin and Nick Rethmeyer from the Rochester Chamber of Commerce. We are beginning now with opening statements and candidate Nelson will begin with hers. Thank you. Greetings. Uh, thank you viewers for participating in our democracy and thank you to the League, the Post Bulletin, the Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce and the Rochester Public Library for conducting these, tonight's forum. I'm State Senator Carla Nelson and I'm honored to serve the good people of Olmstead County. I'm a mom, a wife, a teacher, a small business owner, your state senator, and most recently, a grandmother. It's been a great honor to meet many of you and work together to make our communities better. Whether it is record-setting funding increases to our schools or empowering institutions like Mayo Clinic to do amazing health care, keeping our communities safe through supporting our police, or being a strong bipartisan lead on education. 
I'm proud of the work that I've done to represent you and work in our communities. But despite these accomplishments, there is much more to do. 2020 has brought forward unprecedented challenges. When COVID-19 hit, I joined my legislative colleagues and the governor to pass hundreds of millions of dollars of funding to help our state and its people. I'm proud of our initial work, but it's clear the challenges we face are real, including a massive budget deficit that will require steady and experienced leaders. In addition, we have great divisions in our communities and healing will not come through elected officials who run to talking points of highly partisan groups. But instead, we need leaders who will bring people together to get things done. You can see my leadership across our community, supporting our world-class patient-centered healthcare, coverage for pre-existing conditions, the Workforce Development Center, the Reading Center, Roundabout, Rochester Children's Museum, Border Enhancements at the Rochester International Airport, Cradle to Career, PTEC, and IMMA Parent Child Plus. I look forward to our discussion together tonight and why I'm uniquely qualified to help our communities. And I come through this, and we can come through this pandemic stronger together. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Borud, your opening statement. Yes, I want to also thank the League, the Post Bulletin, the Chamber, and this library for hosting this event, and thank you to everyone who's taking the time to watch. I'm Dr. Alita Borud, a physician, geriatrician, trained in public health. I'm running because I believe each one of us deserves to live in, with dignity, and too many of us are struggling to put food in the fridge and a roof over our heads. As a Mayo doctor, I saw patients from all over the world who presented with the most complex problems. I carried the weight of knowing that if I didn't find an answer, it was very likely that patient would never have another chance to get an answer. The buck stopped with me. So I gave my all to finding those answers. We're facing the most challenging moment in our history uh, as your next senator, I make the same commitment to you that I will give my all to find solutions to these problems and crises that we face. And I believe our community will be safer when everybody has the health care they need and a secure home. Our public schools are anchors for our families. They provide education, food security, and connection with social services. Education could be the great equalizer, but we can't close the opportunity gap and create a bright future for every student without a commitment, a deep commitment to an investment to their success. Finally, I believe in science. Uh, COVID is not just the flu. It cannot be wished away. It's time that we put politics aside to care for each other. I'll work with our public health officials and our governor to do all I can to make sure that we stop the spread of this virus. Our economy will not heal until we do so. I look forward to this conversation. Thank you for your opening statements, can, uh, candidates. Our first question tonight is going to come from the League of Women Voters. And the question will be directed towards candidate Borud first. How do you see COVID-19 impacting the state budget and what will your priorities be? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Well, we know that we are going into a very profound deficit and thank goodness that we came into it with um, big reserves due to the careful stewarding of our resources in the last year by our democratic leadership and the leadership of Governor um, Dayton before Governor Waltz. You know, everything is going to have to be on the table. I think we're going to have to make some tough decisions, but you know, 70% of the budget of our state is both health and human services and education funding. We cannot cut our way through um, uh, this deficit. So yes, we need to have everything on the table, but I do think that we have to look at some of the tax breaks that were given out before, for instance, I think we have to look at the, uh, the property tax re, um, reductions that corporations received. You know, I think um, we also have to think about new revenue um, from perhaps uh, corporate, an increase in corporate taxes 
but certainly when we think about this, we cannot um, think about um, increasing taxes on our working people, knowing that um, if we don't have sufficient revenue as well, that our local government and our county government will not have the funding they need. Thank you. Candidate Nelson. Thank you. Uh, would you repeat that question, please? I will. Thank you. How do you see COVID-19 impacting the state budget, and what will your priorities be? Thank you. Uh, COVID-19 is impacting the state budget, just like it's impacting every aspect of our lives. One of the best things we can do is to make sure that our economy comes back strong. If there have been great challenges uh, with the economy. We need to, people need to know that they can safely come back to those, uh, to those retailers and those restaurants. It is important as state legislators that we look to increasing the economic growth and thereby taxes to our state through economic growth, not increased tax rates. Uh, we are one of the highest tax states in the nation, and that does throttle uh, economic growth. I have a track history of uh, working in severe budget deficit times. Uh, we need that type of steady, experienced leadership as we go into this, what looks to be a $5 billion deficit. One of the best things we can do is examine every program that we have, and we have many. Uh, as we say, look under those couch cushions and find out the things that are not working or that where dollars could be allocated to achieve, to achieve better results. Yes, and you have a rebuttal. Yes, I would just like to point out, Senator Nelson, that in 2011 through the 2012 um, biennium, you um, supported Governor Pawlenty's um, borrowing $2.7 billion from our schools, and as a result, we have never quite gotten back to the same level of funding that our schools had in 2003. And so while you say that we had a record increase in funding last year, you fought for a 0.5% increase that when you account for inflation actually represents a decrease in funding for our public schools. And we have a rebuttal. Uh, thank you so much. Well, I understand that might be the narrative that would, one would like to put out there, but it is not the facts. The facts are that our investments in education have outpaced the CPI since 2003. The charts showing that are on the Minnesota Department of Education website, so people are welcome to go and see the facts for themselves. So definitely there have been increases in education funding, and it has superseded, uh, exceeded the CPI. Thank you. Our next question comes from the League of Women Voters, and we're going to begin with candidate Nelson. How do you see the state generating the needed revenue to repair and replace our roads? Thank you. Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, roads and bridges are one of the priorities of government. They must be. Our lives, our commerce rides on roads and bridges. There are a couple things that we can and should do. One is make sure that the dollars that we have are going to the most needed areas. One of those that I'm working on is the intersection at Highway 14 and 104. That's a dangerous intersection. Secondly, we need to replace the declining source of revenue, the gas tax, with the tax that is on those parts that are used for uh, vehicles and automated, automotive resources. We have started that. But we need to do more. We need to return all of those uh, taxes on automotive resources to roads and bridges. Right now, not 100% are going there. Thank you. And candidate Borud? Yes. Well, one of the things that needed to happen is that we needed to get a bonding bill passed because there was money there to support our infrastructure and roads and bridges. But I also believe that if we are going to really repair our crumbling infrastructure, we need a dedicated funding stream. And in fact, if we do have that and we fund our, our infrastructure, uh, this puts in, uh, really important money back in our economy with high paying jobs. So the vast majority of Minnesotans actually do support uh, gas tax. I think we need to look at that, especially since uh, the price of gasoline is so low at this time. But uh, I think we also have to look at other um, funding streams for uh, roads and bridges, but we need a dedicated funding stream. It cannot come out of the general fund. 
Thank you. Our next two questions will come from the Rochester Post Bulletin. Uh, the first one will be addressed first by candidate Borud. Um, I'd like to ask your uh, opinions about uh, an issue uh, related to banning of uh, uh, conversion therapy. Uh, it's been a hot topic at the legislature the last couple of years. I noticed the Rochester City Council recently passed a resolution basically saying it doesn't support it and I would like to see a statewide ban. Um, I was wondering where both of you stand on this issue of you know, banning um, conversion therapy and it's basically uh, attempting to convert a gay person into a straight person. Well, the, the science is quite clear on this and as a physician, I follow the science that this is considered to, to actually be barbaric and harmful to our children. Um, we know that um, people, uh, the gender is not um, a, a total binary, that people have, um, that gender is on a spectrum and that you know people have different preferences um, in terms of their sexuality and those are two separate issues of course but I believe that we absolutely must ban conversion therapy. I mean, I look at a state such as Utah, which I consider to perhaps be more conservative than Minnesota, they've banned conversion therapy. So we are actually behind the curve on this one. And the science um, and the medical field supports banning conversion therapy. Thank you, candidate Nelson. Thank you. Conversion therapy is not the jurisdiction of the state government. Uh, that is what we look to our medical boards for. So clearly the uh, science, the culture is evolving on this issue, uh, but I look to our medical boards which regulate our um, medical practices, the medical practice board, for example, uh, also uh, to actually uh, look at whether a ther a, um, any particular therapy should be banned. It is out of the jurisdiction of the state legislature. Thank you. Another question from the Post Bulletin will begin with candidate Nelson. Uh, Minnesota continues to have a persistent achievement gap between white and minority students in terms of performance and graduation. Uh, early this year, a retired Supreme Court justice uh, and a Federal Reserve Bank president proposed a constitutional amendment to guarantee children the right to a quality education. Um, what ideas do you propose and support to address this gap and, and also to improve the education of all students? Oh, thank you, Matt. I'm so glad you asked that. As I said, I'm a teacher and I'm also the chairwoman of the Education Committee in the Minnesota State Senate. Uh, education is the great equalizer. That is what uh, is part and parcel of our mission on the E12 Committee. It's on every agenda. And one of the things that we can do to make sure that achievement gaps are closed and every student has a great education is make sure the kids are ready for kindergarten when they get there. I've been a leader in high quality early learning scholarships to children who would not otherwise get that. Uh, that is important in getting kids ready for kindergarten. We also need to make sure that kids are reading well by the end of third grade. And to that end, I've supported um, the uh, reading center here in Rochester. Uh, of course, uh, informed teaching with uh, scientific evidence-based reading instruction. And those are the type of things that we need to do to make sure that all of our kids uh, are ready for uh, career and success afterwards. So closing the achievement gap starts young. Thank you, candidate Borwood. Well, this is something I feel very passionate about because Rochester is one of the largest um, opportunity gaps in the state that ranks number two in terms of the largest uh, opportunity gap amongst all states. You know, the, uh, there was a Teacher of Color and American Indian Teacher Act that was passed in 2017. There's been no hearings in the Senate um, in the Education Committee to actually put funding behind that bill to actually make it a reality. And in fact, there was not a hearing this year on the Increased Teachers of Color Act um, that uh, did, was not about any increased funding, but actually a policy change saying that we are going to commit to increasing the uh, pipeline of teachers of color because, of course, we know that in diverse classrooms, diverse classrooms and diverse teachers actually benefit all students, uh, not just students of color. So, you know, I when I talk to um, African-American leaders in our community, they say we need funding 
behind the tokate bill that um, we can't expect paraprofessionals to in, uh, go up through the pipeline when they can actually make more money in uh, working for McDonald's. Thank you. Our next two questions will come from the Chamber of Commerce. We're going to begin with candidate Nelson. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has severely impacted local small businesses across the state, including here in the Rochester area. What additional measures must the state take to help these businesses stabilize their operations and recover? Thank you for the question. Because it is our small businesses that are the backbone of our country, of our state, and of our economic recovery. One of the things that we can do is make sure that the programs that the federal government, uh, the funding the federal government has set our way, and in the state of Minnesota, we have already passed $30 million for small business grants. I was glad to be part of that. Um, and we need to continue to make sure, though, that all of our businesses um, are, that are eligible are included. Uh, some of the language right now would prohibit sole proprietorships, sole proprietors who are not registered with the Secretary of State. I believe that is a mistake. Sole proprietors have no reason to register with the Secretary of State if they're doing business under their own name. And so I think that is a gap that needs to be closed. I've been working with Tim Penny, with Smith, to work to close that loophole so that all of our businesses can get uh, state assistance, federal assistance as available, and then to make sure that our economy is able to come back. Uh, and include that does include the bonding bill. I'm on the bonding committee. I have been and continue to work towards that bill. It is a jobs bill. It's a responsible bill, and it's what we should be doing uh, as legislators. Thank you. And candidate for me. Yes. Well, you know, in 2008, it was small businesses and the creativity of people pursuing their dreams that really drove the economic recovery. And I believe that can be, happen again. But right now, what we need to do is actually save the small businesses that we have. I know that there is $40 million that was set aside in the budget to grow new businesses, but we need to keep the businesses we have. And Governor Walsh needs the flexibility to reallocate those dollars to make sure that our small businesses get grants to keep them alive. Um, I also know that for most small businesses, one of the biggest expenses they have is healthcare costs. And if we can actually make uh, use our state to provide an option for farmers, small business owners, and other people who can't afford insurance on the uh, marketplace, that this would be a big help to small businesses to grow. But I also agree, we need to pass the bonding bill because that will actually pump uh, money through our economy and then people will be able to spend. But finally, people will not go back to businesses until we control COVID-19. People will not feel safe to go back to restaurants and small businesses until we control that. Thank you. Our next question from the Chamber of Commerce will go first to candidate Borud. The pandemic has led to millions of Americans losing their jobs across the country, including many here in our region. What steps must the state take to promote job creation and put thousands of Minnesotans back to work? Yes. Well, again, I, I will reiterate the last point I made. I think we need consistent leadership uh, amongst all our elected officials who unite behind the science about how this COVID-19 virus is spread so that we can actually begin to control the spread in our community. Um, I think that's really an important step. I think we also, as um, was last said, I think we need to uh, pass the bonding bill. You know, the interest rate is near zero. This would be an, an important way to actually pump money through our economy. Um, and I, I think as well, we need to continue to invest in our schools, even though this is a really challenging moment for our government, but these children are our future and they need to have the education to be able to succeed, especially in Rochester when you think that we have, um, we're going to need a very highly educated workforce and we need to invest in the success of our children. Thank you and candidate Nelson. Thank you. Small businesses are, are, are critical and uh, one of the things that we can do is uh, and getting the economy coming back truly is through that bonding bill. 
It is a jobs bill, as I said. It is essential. We ran into some pushback. The Senate is ready to pass that bonding bill. In fact, I think we'll be seeing that soon. We ran into some pushback from the minority in the Senate, which would be Democrats, and the minority in the House, which would be Republicans. I think better heads are prevailing, so I'm glad about that. Um, I've also been uh, awarded by uh, Medical Alley for some of my work with tax credits to try and encourage entrepreneurs and, uh, and uh, innovations. And we live in a city that's really ripe with that. And we want to continue to allow that. And sometimes that involves a, a state tax credit. Uh, and that passed as the Angel Investor Tax Credit. Uh, it was my bill uh, several years ago. Uh, it's been passed into law. Of course, oftentimes we need to uh, relook at that and see, uh, is it still relevant or do we need to uh, invest more in that Angel Investor Tax Credit? But that is very important. Uh, and those are things that I will uh, continue to work on. Thank you. Our next two questions come from the public. Uh, this first one will be directed towards candidate Borud first. Should the state of Minnesota be doing more to protect the water quality in our lakes and rivers? The health of people is, is completely tied to the health of our land, absolutely. We have a significant problem with nitrate pollution um, through a large swaths of Minnesota. And, you know, I have worked extensively with our farming community around um, practices to actually clean water by doing soil building practices with um, uh, cover cropping and um, interseeding, rotational grazing, grazing perennial um, uh, plantings that actually help to clean our water. I mean, farmers do not want to have their soil and their fertilizer and, uh, washed away with each intensifying storm that we are seeing with climate change. Um, so absolutely, I think we need to do everything we can to, you know, to move towards a change in our practices to reduce um, the nitrates in our water, because I know that in some of our rural communities, it's a huge expense that we don't have, and we're not investing in the water treatment facilities small communities need to make sure that their water is safe, especially for their children. Thank you. Candidate Nelson. Water quality is essential. And one of the things that uh, I'm glad that we have in the state of Minnesota is the uh, clean water uh, sales tax piece that is dedicated to uh, clean water, arts and cultural, and uh, the environment. And under water quality, a number of the uh, initiatives that I have supported that I think are important and that we should continue with uh, include point source implementation grants to try and uh, keep the source of uh, pollution from getting into our rivers and streams uh, with uh, funding, wastewater infrastructure funding to keep that wastewater out of our uh, soil and keep it contained. Certainly dredging in some places like uh, in um, Lake Zumbro, our uh, Great Lakes, to make sure that those harbors are still available uh, to be used. And sometimes we've had, uh, we have to clean up uh, the past mistakes from years before, and that's the case in, uh, in, the, in the Duluth Harbor. Uh, those are some of the things that we have done in the past, but we need to continue to do those. And that funding uh, comes largely, as I said, out of that sales tax uh, extension. And one of the best ways that we can continue to fund that, especially in a budget challenge like this, is if our economy is rolling back and more of those sales tax dollars are uh, being uh, expended and brought to treat water quality. Thank you. Our next question from the, pub from the public will begin with candidate Nelson. The question is, should Minnesota restrict the sales of flavored tobacco products to protect kids from addiction? And what else do you think we could be doing to address the problem of flavored tobacco products? Oh, I'm so glad you brought that forward. Uh, that is such an important piece. Uh, people in this community know that I have been a champion for uh, fighting big, big tobacco and supporting our kids. Uh, this year, we finally passed Tobacco 21. Uh, I was a leader on that way back in uh, 16 and 17. Uh, and that does help with the flavors. Um, but there is a question to be had about flavors. So kids under 21 will not be buying flavored tobacco, and that's thanks to T21. And everyone agrees that that is the most important thing that we could get done, and I'm very glad that we did. 
Uh, there, are, there is a question about should adults be able to smoke uh, tobacco that has flavors in it? And in particular, one of those questions has to do with menthol, which um, is uh, marketed heavily uh, to our black community. So there's a lot of uh, discussion about that. I'm going to have an open ear, hopefully, as we get back into session and have real hearings where we can hear from the public. I think that is a, a very worthy uh, discussion to have. At this point, there has not been uh, significant discussion and public input on tobacco uh, banning flavors for tobacco for adults. But let us rejoice in the fact that T21 passed and our kids are no longer being marketed with candy flavored tobacco products. Thank you, candidate Boru. Well, as a physician, of course, we need to do all that we can to keep our kids from being uh, becoming addicted to uh, nicotine. And of course, this is kind of a gateway drug for uh, young people, um, flavored tobacco, to become addicted to nicotine. Um, and then uh, moving on to perhaps vaping. And, um, and of course, there's a, a lot of vape products that teens are also using that are flavored um, products. Um, I would like to just um, point out that the T21 bill was originally carried by um, Senator Eaton, who was a registered nurse for a long time and trying to push this um, into the Senate. And it was then taken up by Senator Nelson. And I'm, I'm grateful that she um, managed to get that passed. And, it's, and it is an important bill. And I agree that as well that menthol, uh, mentholated cigarettes have been targeted specifically against our African-American community because, of course, the menthol makes it easier to actually initiate um, smoke, uh, s smoking. And so banning that uh, or re uh, increasing the fees on packs of tobacco would be an important step to reducing use. Thank you. Our next question will come from the League of Women. We're going to take a question from each of us now. So the League of Women Voters question is next. We're going to begin with candidate Borud. The question is, what is your stance on expanding Minnesota's gun violence prevention legislation to require criminal background checks on guns purchased at gun shows online or from individuals? That is a very, very important question. Of course, as a physician, I support gun sense legislation, and the vast majority of Minnesotans do support that. You know, my father. Um, actually was suicidal after um, my mother died unexpectedly and the sheriff came and took uh, the gun away from the home, which I was uh, glad for. So, you know, of course, he had a legally um, purchased gun um, and it was imp it's important that we pass also red flag laws to make sure that, um, our, uh, that people, that law enforcement can legally um, help families protect their loved ones but certainly those loopholes that allow people who should not have guns to have them is something that we need to um, pass. Uh, I would like to point out that gun violence is the, the number one cause of death for teens and young adults. It is a public health emergency. And as, also as somebody who's a geriatrician who's worked with her farmers, I know that this is a, a, a group that it's at high risk right now for suicide in the midst of this farm crisis. We need, to, we need to do all we can to pass gun sense legislation, including closing those loopholes. Thank you, candidate Nelson. Thank you for the question. Certainly gun violence is a concern. It's a great concern. It seems to be a growing concern that we're hearing more and more about with the, with the riots and the unrest. And it's something that uh, should uh, spark fear in every one of us. Um, number one, it's critical, you know, when someone says loopholes, well, what is a loophole? So you need to know exactly what that is and what you're trying to close. Uh, but more importantly, um, it's so important that we enforce the laws that we have on the books. I'm also concerned about the number of deaths by guns, which are suicide. A large number of gun deaths are suicide. And I think one of the things that we can try to do and be proactive to get real results, I'm about real results, uh, not just uh, talking points, but just real results here, is to really focus on a mental illness and make sure that 
people are getting the help that they need uh, when they need it. Also making sure that um, our schools are safe places for our kids. That's why I led the $25 million uh, funding for safe and secure schools. I'm glad to say that passed. Uh, and some of that does include additional uh, money for mental health, counselors, social workers. So I think we need a all of the above uh, solution to gun violence. I don't think it's just one thing. And we need to be very careful with the words we use and look to make sure um, are they going to achieve the, des the results that we look for. Thank you. Our next question will come from the Post Bulletin. We're going to begin with candidate Nelson. So I'd like to talk about another smokable product. Uh, where do you stand on the legalization of marijuana for recreational purposes? Um, Matt, I'm glad you asked that. And I think uh, our, we should know that uh, today we're sad because one of the candidates for one of the legalized marijuana parties, there's two of them, I can't remember the exact name of the party, actually suddenly died today. And so the second congressional district elections will be postponed. Um, that's a big issue uh, regarding uh, should we legalize marijuana? Uh, I tend not to be in favor of legalizing marijuana, at least not now. There's a couple problems. One, it's still a class one drug from the feds that causes all kinds of problems. But more importantly, there's a huge safety problem, uh, particularly you can look in the states that have already legalized this, uh, because there is no way at this point to determine if someone is under the influence. And if you talk to law enforcement, uh, that is one of the number one issues. It is safety on our roads. Uh, I'm also concerned about the availability of marijuana, particularly for teenagers. There's seven times increase uh, for um, severe mental health issues. So I just do not believe that that is a wise choice uh, at this time. Thank you. Candidate Borud. Well, I think legislators need to face reality. You know, their decades-long war on drugs has actually been a failure. Uh, our studies show that 40% of uh, high schoolers can tell you who is selling marijuana in their schools. You know, it would be safer for our children if we moved that underground market into a legal market where it could actually be regulated and the purity and safety of the products um, can be ascertained. For those people who are actually using marijuana to treat um, conditions, whether it's severe spasticity related to multiple sclerosis or cancer, it would actually imp uh, make those products more uh, less expensive for people who have to pay high fees to be able to even afford to use um, cannabis. Um, finally, I think one of the other issues is that it's a racial justice issue and that um, people should not um, be entangled with our legal system and, and receive a felony for a nonviolent offense. We need facts to guide this decision. Studies show that there's no increase in crime or an increase in teen use with legalization. Thank you. Our next question comes from the Chamber of Commerce. We're going to begin with candidate Nelson. Minnesota has yet to conform to the federal tax code, which creates an undue burden on local citizens and businesses. What steps will you take to help streamline our state tax system and ensure it conforms with the federal code, including Section 179? Oh, I'm so glad for that question. Uh, clearly, uh, to revamp and retool our economy, one of the things we need to do is be a very competitive place, not only to do business, but to expand businesses, whether it be farms or, or large uh, expenditures in other businesses. And we do not conform with 179, Section 179. I have carried that bill a number of times, uh, and I believe that we may actually see it pass this year. And if we really want to jumpstart our economy, let's conform to Section 179. Uh, that allows uh, full uh, depreciation at the time the dollars are spent, rather than putting it out over time, making our businesses uh, actually uh, uh, pay to, um, to hold to, before they can get their funding for that. We need to be competitive on a number of areas with uh, federal uh, conformity as well. Um, one of the issues that we have here in Minnesota is we have the commercial statewide business tax, which just adds about 30% to every business tax bill. Property tax, it's not really property tax. Uh, a couple years ago, my bill passed that 
stop the automatic inflator on that, but we actually need to look at rolling that back. Our brick and mortar businesses already have a difficult time. So federal conformity on section 179, get rid of the CI misnamed business property tax. Thank you, candidate Borud. Well, yes, section 179 is very critical, uh, you know, for somebody who's been deeply involved with our farming community. I know that this is of concern to farmers who are really struggling to just um, stay afloat at this moment. And what it does allow uh, is uh, an expedited depreciation um, from, for farm purchases um, so that they can write that off on their taxes um, in this really critical um, struggling moment for farmers. Um, uh, with regards to um, the cut in corporate property taxes in 2017, I'd just like to say that that cost us $1 billion um, by eliminating the inflation on state the business property tax le levy. And approximately 50% of those um, corporations who received that um, tax benefit, which is costing our state $1 billion in taxes that we desperately need right now, approximately 50% of those businesses uh, aren't even based in Minnesota. So I think we have to look at everything that we in, um, can to be able to balance the budget so it's, we're not balancing the budget on the back of the most marginalized. Uh, just a quick rebuttal. Quick rebuttal. Uh, actually, I, I believe the good doctor is thinking of something different. Uh, the commercial business-wide property tax only applies to Minnesota buildings uh, that are in Minnesota play, paying that tax to the state of Minnesota. All right, thank you. The next uh, question is going to come from the public. And the question is, what do you think will be or is the most challenging aspect of being a member of the legislature. We're going to begin with candidate Borud. Well, this um, crisis that we're in uh, is going to be the most, uh, the biggest challenge that I think this state has faced in recent memory because of the size of the deficit that we're facing and the, the crises that people are experiencing right now in terms of the insecurity they face um, uh, economically. Um, so I, I think it's being able to be honest, transparent, calling everybody to the table who is a stakeholder and putting people first in terms of uh, our priorities um, for uh, the money that we're going to spend. For instance, I said before, 70% of our budget is education and he health and human services. It's very difficult to imagine cutting those, um, but I think what we need to do is actually communicate, be transparent, have lots of hearings with our constituents um, and all stakeholders to be able to find the best solutions. Everybody needs to be at the table on this one. Thank you, candidate Nelson. Thank you, uh, that is true. We need everyone at the table. We need everyone's hearts and hands and willingness uh, to help. It's going to be a challenging time. There's just no doubt about it. And I think one of the things that uh, I know has seemed to spike is really the incivility among our fellow Minnesotans. That's not who we are. Uh, we are Minnesota nice. We can disagree with someone on a particular topic. Um, as one of your guests said the other night, one of the challenges is everybody comes with their own facts. And that is a problem. We need to be able to substantiate uh, facts and then agree upon those facts, but we know there will be different ways to, to handle problems and we need to have respectful dialogue about that. I don't think social media helps. I don't think a president election, presidential election helps, but uh, civility is key. That's one of the reasons why I have um, authored and passed out of the Minnesota Senate one of the league's priorities, which is character education, civics education uh, for our students. I'm glad to say it passed the Senate. We still have more work to do. It didn't quite get out of the house, but civics education is something all Minnesotans should have, and it will lead to better government. Thank you. Our next question comes from the League of Women Voters. We're going to begin with candidate Nelson. The question is, how would you improve relations with the members of the other political party? I think that is a great question. I think once, uh, as I said, things seem to ramp up in election years, but particularly on those presidential years. And so I'm quite hopeful that as we um, get back into 
uh, session, uh, as, as folks come back to the Capitol, one, be nice if we had that vaccine and we were a little bit more free to do some of the, um, some of the conversations that we have one-to-one -one that we're not having under the pandemic. Uh, but I think, again, mutual respect and looking for those areas, I always look for those areas, I call them the sweet spots, those things that everybody agrees upon. And then we have to find those areas and then figure out a way that we can either fund those or make the policy decisions and then move forward. And most good things, let me tell you, most good things are bipartisan. And the key, th if, you, if you want to not solve a problem, just make it a partisan problem and it will continue. Uh, but we really need to do it the Minnesota way, which is Minnesota nice. And I think we will return to that. Uh, I think we'll return to that hopefully in January. And we hope to see Minnesota government back to the way that we're used to living. Thank you. And candidate Borud. Well, I agree. We need all stakeholders at the table. I think our democracy is much stronger when every voice is heard. I think one of the um, bills I'm excited about is the possibility of a local options bill for ranked choice voting, because I think it, in fact, uh, calls us to really discuss issues and not um, pull us apart into polls, um, which is divisive in our uh, civic life. Um, you know, I'll just say that uh, as somebody who has led many initiatives in, in organizations across the state, I, I think in particular over the last year, I was in an organization where people were very polarized and I thought it might actually destroy the organization, but I traveled all over the state and listened to all the um, stakeholders in that organization and we were able to move past that by finding our shared values. Um, and so I think that's very important. I think one of the things that I'm disappointed about is the fact that at the end of the uh, school year um, in the Education Committee, there were no hearings called to bring all the stakeholders together to be able to really find uh, solutions to how we can best educate our children come this fall. Thank you. Our next question comes from the Rochester Post Bulletin. We're going to begin with candidate Borod. Um, I'd like to ask your stance on Medicare for All. Um, according to a U.S. Census report, uh, approximately 240,000 Minnesotans, a quarter of a million people, lacked health insurance in 2018. But we also hear that a government-run or universal health care would be, pays a fraction of the dollar than so, uh, private insurance does. And it's obviously not an abstract question since Rochester is home to the Mayo Clinic, and some people argue that such a system would be damaging to the clinic. Where do you stand on this issue of uh, Medicare for All? You know, it's clear that no one is going to be healthy in this pandemic unless everyone has health care um, access. The system is clearly broken. Um, you know, Matt, as you'd said, a number, you know, uh, several hundred thousand people have uh, inadequate access to health care. And in fact, I've heard that up to 40% of Minnesotans with employer based insurance can't use it because the co pays are so high. You know, while premiums are stable, out-of-pockets are increasing. You know, it's the number one cause of farm bankruptcies. So, you know, I'm looking at the fact that if the ACA goes away and 90,000 Minnesotans have experienced COVID, many of those people are going to now have pre-existing conditions because we know that there are lingering health effects with COVID-19. So. We are going, these folks, if the ACA goes away as, being, as promised and as Senator Nelson said she would like to do away with the ACA in 2018, that these people will be uninsurable. So we need uh, some answer to this and I'm willing to dig in with anybody at the legislature to make sure that we have affordable options for everyone to get the health care access they need. Thank you, candidate Nelson. Thank you. Uh, regarding Medicare for All and Minnesotans uninsured, uh, before Obamacare, Minnesota was doing it right. You might recall we had the MNSHA, Minnesota Comprehensive Health Assessment, and anyone in the state of Minnesota that was denied because of pre-existing conditions or anything else could get insurance through MNSHA. And their premiums were held down because the state taxpayers are paid to hold those premiums down to something they could afford. When Obamacare came along, and it was a national solution maybe to the problems in Texas or Louisiana, but it was foisted on Minnesota, and that caused a great problem. Um, 
So what do we do now? Uh, I think now one of the things that we can't, we should not do is Medicare for all. Our rural hospitals will not be there to serve your loved ones uh, if we have Medicare for all. The reimbursement rates are too low. That is like Medicaid, Medicare for everyone. And it will stifle innovation that cure for Alzheimer's. Uh, those type of innovations, the deep brain stimulation, the regenerative uh, therapies that are happening right down the street at Mayo, those type of things will be in jeopardy. So I do not support Medicare for all. It will be dangerous to patients and health care and taxpayers. Yeah, we have a rebuttal. You know, Senator Nelson talks about MSHA, and I've talked with people who've lived through this, and yes, you know, it was a, a program to support the premiums for people who had pre-existing conditions, but people still struggled to find affordable health care with pre-existing conditions. And there are going to be tens of thousands of those Minnesotans with pre-existing conditions. You know, if what you're talking about is, yes, we do need to support um, our rural hospitals and clinics. They're closing as a crisis in rural health care. We need to fight for increased reimbursement in our public insurance programs to make sure that our rural population continues to be served. Thank you. Our next question will come from the Chamber of Commerce. We're going to begin with candidate Borun. This year was a bonding year and a deal has yet to be reached. What steps will you take as an elected official to promote the successful passage of a future bonding measure or measures to ensure local transportation projects receive the funding they need? Hmm. That's, a, that's a wonderful question because it, it is absolutely critical. Has it been five years that we haven't passed a bonding bill? Um, and yet it's, it's something that would be the most important stimulus to our economy right now. We have to realize that why, why did it stop? Why did we not pass a bonding bill? It was because the uh, fight to say that Governor Walz has to give up his emergency powers, his tools that he has used to keep Minnesotans safe, to get Mayo Clinic to expedite the production of testing supplies, to make sure that we could find out who has COVID. He helped work with um, local producers to make PPE for our workers to keep them safe in COVID. This, the re Republican leadership in the House stalled that over this fight to have Governor Waltz give up his emergency powers when 49 other governors in this country have those emergency powers. So, I think we have to, in, when it comes to what our community's needs are, we have to put aside that kind of fight and think about the greater good and pass that bonding bill and put people to work. Thank you, candidate Nelson. Uh, repeat that question, please. This year was a bonding year and a deal is yet to be reached. What steps will you take as an elected official to promote the successful passage of future bonding measures to ensure local transportation projects receive the funding they need. Thank you. Um, as a member of the Capital Investment Committee, um, certainly I have been working on this uh, bonding bill, and we have some good news that uh, working with uh, Chair Sengem, it looks like an agreement is to be had. Of course, there was an agreement several months ago, but people have to want to participate in that. Uh, just a, a quick correction. We have had bonding bills in the last five years, so uh, that is just not accurate to say there haven't been. Um, I have voted for every bonding bill, uh, even if I'm the only Republican to do so. I do that because I believe bonding bills are job bills. They're res the responsible thing for us to do, and they're good for the environment. So um, I will continue to work uh, to make sure those bonding bills pass. As I've said, I voted for every one. Continue to do so, and continue to encourage others uh, who did not vote for a bonding bill to do so. I'm hopeful that we will be seeing something soon. I believe, as my dad always taught me, where there is a will, there is a way. And there is a way in the Senate. The Senate has st stood tall and strong for a bonding bill uh, this year, every time. Uh, actually, uh, had it passed, had, it, had enough votes in the Senate, and then um, there was some involvement to uh, dissuade a few of those uh, Democrats who were supporting it from doing so. But we think we'll be back on track in the next uh, few weeks, and it's, in, it's important. Thank you. I was going to try to fit one more in, but um, I think it's time for our closing statements. 
reminding you that you've got two minutes to make your closing statements, each of you. And um, by luck of the draw, candidate Borud has, uh, is going first. Well, thank you, everyone. I want to say that I learned as a doctor that to address my patient's problems, I needed to listen. I really needed to listen and respect what people told me. Just, I just talked with a young woman who was completely discouraged about the bitter divisiveness in our politics. She talked, I listened, and I said, you know, I agree. In this crisis, more unites us than divides us, and we don't have time to fight each other when so much is at stake. As your next senator, I will listen and bring stakeholders and constituents together so the best ideas are at the table. The families I talk with are exhausted juggling the multiple demands of work, of childcare, and remote learning. We must get this right so women and our families don't continue to lose ground in this pandemic. And I won't fail you in this crisis. I will not cut the funding for healthcare that a million Minnesotans depend on. I will not vote to end childcare assistance in a childcare shortage. I will not take away the tools our, government need, our governor needs in a global emergency to keep us safe. And I won't undermine our government in a pandemic by firing dedicated public servants just to make a political point. I promise to address the opportunity gap in our schools, which is persisting, to make health care affordable for more Minnesotans and to pass bills to fix our infrastructure. The next biennium will be the most challenging in our memory, and I'm committed to doing everything I can to make sure that people in this community will not fall through the cracks. As your senator, I will address these challenges head on. I will match my votes with my words. It will be an honor to represent you, and I ask for your vote by November 3rd. Thank you, candidate Nelson. Thank you so much. It is no doubt that our state is going to face real challenges. It's going to take more than talking points to solve a budget deficit. And it takes more than proposing big, expensive ideas with drastic impacts on our local economy. We must not make promises that we cannot afford. It does take real leadership to ask those tough questions, and it requires a political will to make tough decisions. We do have divisions in our society, and many politicians see those as an opportunity to score political points. At a time when we really need as hardworking citizen legislatures who will bring people together to get things done. Uh, just like I've done when I authored and passed the Teachers of Color Act in 2016, 17. And you know, I had to fight with people in my own caucus. But I do that because my job is to fight and work for the people in this district, regardless of what party they happen to belong to. I have a record as a problem solver who works to find common sense solutions and common ground. I've spent 10 years as a tireless advocate for the Senate District 26 Olmstead County constituents. And should I be fortunate enough to uh, be re-election, I will, to be re-elected, I will continue to do that each day. The only interest I have is the success of those in our communities. I would humbly ask for your vote now. And I would also just like to add something important to this, uh, to the League of Women Voters. Uh, I was the author of the ERA amendment uh, in the Minnesota Senate, hoping that we will have success uh, moving forward. I know now there's a lot uh, at stake uh, regarding that, but I think uh, most of us expect that women have equal rights. And um, I will continue to push through that. It wasn't that long ago that my mother was told she couldn't teach in the school where my dad was a high school principal. Another woman said she couldn't be pregnant as a teacher. So we have done some good things, but we have much more to do. I, I ask for your vote to continue working on those things. Thank you. Thank you, the candidates. Uh, I would like to thank each of the candidates for participating in tonight's forum. Thank you for your service to the community and for your willingness to participate in the democratic process by running for office. I would like to remind you all that the views uh, offered tonight are those of the candidates and not those of the 
uh, uh, League of Women Voters Rochester or the partners or sponsors of this event. Thanks to our partners, the Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce, the Rochester Post Bulletin, and the Rochester Public Library. Remember that Election Day is November 3rd and that early voting has already started. If you have voted by absentee ballot and would like to, uh, to change your ballot based on what you learned tonight, you can go to mnvotes.org, that's M-N-V-O-T-E-S.org, for more information on the process. Remember to vote. If you have a question about your polling place or you'd like to see your sample ballot, visit vote411.org, that's a League of Women Voters site, V-O-T-E-411.org. To see this forum again, access the forums from the Rochester Public Library website. Good night, everybody.